If you go on the eBird Facebook group, you can read about the trials and tribulations that people sometimes have with eBird reviewers. And that is not the case here in this area. We have two amazing reviewers who are very much connected with the birding community in Lower Hudson and a delight to work with. And tonight they're going to take us behind the scenes, help us know what we don't know yet about eBird, this amazing worldwide giant citizen science project that makes a difference for birds and their habitats. So thanks for being with us here, Sean and Kyle, and I turn it over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anne. Um, so first, we obviously just like to say thank you to Anne for coordinating this for us. Um, I, we've kind of been pushing for this event for a while now. Um, I feel like we kind of forced it in here, but I really appreciate it. Well, Kyle and I both really appreciate it. Um, and to all the other chapters for promoting it. So as it's no secret, you just go on any of the region nine eBird pages and you can see that the hobby is doing more than exceptional. And in some counties even beyond exceptional, with tons of people birding right now. And so as a result, there's a lot of records that have to get reviewed. So the main purpose of having this presentation was to um, kind of just reach out to everybody before it bring push. We've already seen drips and drafts of it, um, but we're due for the big one in the next coming weeks. And so we just want to everybody on the same page um, and also just put kind of a name to face because um, you probably get some emails from us, but you don't know who we are. And we've probably crossed paths in the field. So, um, yeah. So again, thank you. And uh, we'll get started. So I'll start with me. So, all right, I'm Sean, as you guys already know. Um, I grew up and lived in Dutchess County for about 23 years, graduated from University of Rhode Island with a wildlife and bi uh, conservation biology degree. Began working for New York City DP as a wildlife biologist in 2014. Um, I'd say casually began birding back in 2006. And then at the end of college, 2009, 2010 is when I really just plunged off the deep end and uh, haven't looked back. Um, well, fun fact, a spark bird for me was a broadwing hawk. Uh, they nested in my backyard in Dutchess County. So in the springtime when they would come back, I would hear them whistling every morning. They wake me up and I'm like, what the hell is this out here? And I would just see these hawks dropping down and picking up squirrels and chipmunks. And um, so that was how, you know, what really started to get me into it because I want to know what these birds were. Um, and we did this presentation for Waterman a couple months ago where we had, where, you know, where our favorite place to bird in Dutchess County is. And for region nine, it's kind of a loaded question. Um, they're really, I mean, every, like there's so many good places in the Hudson Valley, um, all the way out from the Bashakill, all the way down to Edith Reed in uh, southeastern Westchester. I mean, there are hundreds of places you can go. Um, so it's really, it's kind of a cop out answer, but there's really nowhere, no good answer. Um, and it just depends on the season and what you, where you feel like going. So, um, Kyle. Yeah, um, and I second everything Sean said, and thanks for having us tonight. Um, nice to see everyone and appreciate you coming out. Um, I think yeah, we're really here to show that we're not some evil robot demons that just unconfirmed sightings. Um, you know, <laughs> might, have, might have a couple hecklers now at this point, but yeah, you know, they're after we'll you. Get past that. So <laughs> I grew up in Westchester and Ossining, and and I uh, grew up birding with Sawmill River Audubon at local spots like Croton Point. Um, I went to school in Syracuse, where I graduated with a degree in environmental resources engineering. Um, so I work up in Poughkeepsie for an engineering firm. And when I'm working from home, I'm not really working. I'm a birder. Um, you know, I started birding locally and have continued to bird since, you know, 2007. Um, my spark bird was a peregrine falcon. And just like Sean says, there's so many places to bird in Region 9, but I think I have to go back to my roots at Croton Point. So I'll select that one for that. So here's just a quick picture of me and Sean from the, the Sawmill Fall uh, Vertathon. We're on the Quick Three Beers team. We're proud of that. So That's over at Six and a Half Station Road in Orange yeah. County. Um, Kyle's looking out on the marsh, and I'm looking into the this little hole in the trees over at the Sitco Pond, uh, trying to pick out some ducks as they kind of filter through the little window I had. 
<laughs> and I'm standing on a bench doing that. <laughs> so, Sean, do you want to do the Ebert yep. mission statement? Mm -hmm. So, um, I feel like this is something that kind of gets overlooked. Um, if everybody you download eBird if you're new to it, or you just, you're always birded, but you just get into eBird and kind of don't realize that it's just more than collecting a list of your birds just to see what you, you saw, where you saw it, um, and who else saw it. Um, so, very simple, again, a simple idea. Every bird watcher has unique knowledge and experience, and their goal is just to gather this information in the form of checklists archive it and share it and use it to power new data-driven approaches to science, conservation, and education. Um, so the, I guess there's never been a level of QC in this hobby before, except for rare bird committees. Um, so eBird, like our job, our job as reviewers is to maintain the database integrity. And that means vetting everyone, including our own friend, sighting. Um, so it's just something to you know, keep in the back of your head when you're out there uh, making checklists that um, it's just not for you, it's for a bigger purpose. At this point, there are tens of dozens of art, uh, scientific articles written using eBird data. Um, so again, just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, while you're out there, there are means if you don't want to be a part of that, um, you know, you could hide all of your data so you just have your lists and you can go on your merry way. Um, but most people, I think, tend to share it. Thanks, Sean. So what do we review and, and how do we help? So the map shown is Region 9. And that includes Ulster, Duchess, Sullivan, Orange, Putnam, Westchester, and Rockland. So me and Sean help review for all these counties, um, but we're not alone. So um, Rich and Andrew Guthrie help review for the entire state, and they also review for these counties. So a lot of times we'll bounce ideas off of them. Um, Kurt McDermott reviews for Orange and Ulster counties. He's been a burger over there for many, many, many years. He's very experienced and knows that area very well. Um, John Haas reviews for Sullivan County, another very experienced burger. Um, he knows that area very well, and he's you know, a good reviewer for that county. Ryan Bass, who lives in Putnam County, is a reviewer for Putnam. He, you know, he knows that area very well and, and reviews. Benjamin Vo Van Dorn also has the authority to review for Westchester. Um, however, I think he's hanging out with David Attenborough over in England getting a PhD or something like that right now. But this is a very interesting you know, area to review. There's a variety of habitat, you know, different areas are known for different birds and it, it all plays into how we review. You know, for example, the salt marshes in Westchester throw a big wrench. You know, birds like clapper rail, things like that are outstanding further north in counties like Westchester and Putnam or Duchess. Um, so we take that all into consideration when we review. So what do we review? So you know, a lot of times, you know, primarily it's rare birds. So pictured here is a grasshopper sparrow at Edith Reed Wildlife Sanctuary. So this bird wouldn't come up in rare in June because it's a common nester at Croton Point. However, in the wintertime, it's a very rare sighting. So if you had that on a checklist, let's say at Edith Reed in January, that would pop up in our queue and we would be looking at it to review it. Um, other things we review are things like high counts. For example, a great blue heron would be a common bird, but if you report 14,000 of them, it's going to trip a filter and we're going to be you know, reviewing it. Um, so Sean's going to talk a little bit more about the filters and how exactly you know, these get tripped and things like that. Um, but we don't only review species. We look at things like protocol errors. Um, so sometimes we'll email you to use a correct hotspot, or if you're, using, if you're including birds from a different hotspot, so we'll email you on those things. A lot of times our work is really um, people that make little simple mistakes like putting pictures in the wrong category and we'll email you just to, hey, heads up, you know, you put white-throated sparrow under the song sparrow category, et cetera. All right, so Anne always likes to say special powers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so 
um, us eBird reviewers do have some special powers, but not as many as I feel like a lot of people may think. Um, so just the obvious, you know, we can confirm and unconfirm sightings. Um, we can flag questionable sightings or incorrect pictures um, while doing our daily peruse of the day's eBird lists. Um, but I mean, we're going to mention this later, but I, we're not the only ones that can flag sightings um, or pictures. I Just pictures, sorry. Um, eBird has a, um, a system where if you submit well over 100 checklists in a given year, you're then qualified in their eyes to um, look into their media gallery and flag pictures that are incorrectly identified. But there are other people looking at these things. Um, and then you have the ability to hide lists that may have sensitivity issues or privacy issues associated with their location. I know earlier this winter, um, some women had a long-eared owl literally outside of their porch in their backyard. So once um, I got wind of that, I did some digging, realized it was in a private location and the checklists were hidden. So nobody could go and uh, check them out or you know, do any funny business trying to see them. Um, we adjust species filters. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. And uh, we, these filters, they determine what constitutes a high count for a particular species, and we can classify birds as rare or not rare. So this picture I thought was very fitting for this presentation. Um, I just want to thank Ginger for getting this photo. Um, and it shows a male house finch on the left and a male purple finch on the right. And this is one of those species that is commonly misidentified in, I'll say, non-eruption years. So last year and the year before that, especially around great backyard bird count time. Um, so the filter might not necessarily call a purple finch rare in Westchester County. So people will record purple finch, but then I'll, I'll we'll, show, we'll show you this in a little while. We can search out all of the purple finch sightings in a given county and then sift through every single one of them. And I did this two years ago and all but one purple finch was a house finch. So um, again, I just thought this picture was awesome and perfectly timed for the presentation. Um, the eBird symbols and what they mean. I'm sure uh, you can look this up on their website. The website's very easy to navigate. Go to the help section. You can just type in a word like red dot and I think it might, this, the page might actually come up. Um, but just thought we would uh, talk about some of the symbols on your checklist. So when you're out there in the field, you kind of realize what you're checking off. Um, so simply no dot, that species is common. It's reported on more than 6% of your checklist of that grid square and time period. Um, so grid square is referring to um, a 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer square around where your checklist hotspot occurs. Um, and then the time period is 10 years of data for the three week period centered on that current week. So if you picture um, it's hard to explain without looking at a calendar, but you just pick the middle week and then the weeks straddling either side of it. Um, that's where it draws the data from it, where it makes these determinations. Um, so the orange half circle, that's an infrequent bird um, reported on at least one, but fewer than 6% of all checklists. Um, the red dot, unreported species not previously recorded on any checklist in that grid. Um, and then on the very bottom, the exclamation sign, that means your count on that species has exceeded the filter limit and we'll need further explanation as how you arrived at that number. So, you know, how did you count a thousand red winged blackbirds or, you know, you could say anything. I counted them by tens, twenties, fifties, uh, even, or if you have a picture illustrating a massive flock of blackbirds, that would even suffice. Um, so kind of, or if it's on a smaller scale, especially, you know, now we're getting into when the yellow warblers will start showing up and Chrome Point will get like 15 of them. You know, I don't know what the filter is on it off the top of my head, but, you know, just some explanation how you arrived at 15. Because um, birds will be shuffling around and stuff. Um, so yeah, just heads up, because I'm sure a lot of these will be popping up in the very near future. 
All right, I'm gonna keep going with these filters. Um, so these filters are parameters that we can set manually. And like I said, determines whether a species is rare or is most likely seen in a given time period. Um, so there's a very kind of confusing thing going on with Region 9. Um, Westchester County has its own filter. And that is because it has the Long Island Sound Association. The rest of Region 9 is grouped together into a single filter. And so that's why some of the species like red-headed woodpecker might not appear as rare in your county. That's because it's common in another. So like that would be a common bird in Ulster. And um, meanwhile, it's not common in Putnam. I would consider that a very rare bird in Putnam County. Um, so we're trying, we're working on that right now. Um, we've been speaking to Ebert Central about it. And hopefully in the near future, all the counties in region now will be broken up. So then their filters can be representative of the reality in that county. Um, so like I said that, and Kyle touched on this, um, you know, this isn't like a filter thing, but this mainly pertains to Westchester County. So we're lucky that we have the Long Island Sound, but we also have the Hudson River. And a lot of these birds like to travel uh, either corridor. Um, there's been ample docu documentation of, you know, terns, sea ducks, shorebirds, salt marsh sparrows up the Hudson River as well. So we're kind of asking, you know, if you come across something like that, like kind of use common sense and be like, wow, all right, that's, that shouldn't be here. It's not rare, but I feel like I should probably provide some more documentation for that. So um, there's one list I wanted to show you guys that has that, and that is this Royal Turn sighting from Tom Warren back in 2018. Now this was in Dobbs Ferry. And to see Royal Turn in Westchester without a hurricane or major tropical storm is a big deal. So the fact that he has these beautiful photos of these birds, um, I mean, this just lends itself to, uh, this is perfect, you know what I mean? Otherwise, it would be hard to accept a record of this bird on the sound, let alone on the Hudson River. So um, this is just one of many examples. I mean, we have scoters up and down the Hudson River and, um, Oh, we have brown pelican. Let's not forget that. That happens fairly recently. So get back to the presentation. All right. I will actually go back to oops, the filters and I will show everyone what those look like. Just move my zoom screen. All right. So the filters, um, there's an error here. I shouldn't say copy. Um, that's just a duplicate of the Region 9 filter. But um, you'll see here, this is just the filters that I'm assigned to. And I'll open one up. We'll open Westchester County because um, it's a little bit more straightforward than the other counties. Um, it looks complicated, but once you sit there and look at it, Ebert provides you with directions. And mind you, all the reviewers' directions are for public consumption. They're all on their website. You can read all about it. Um, so you can see here, um, snow geese, there is a limit, you know, from 50 birds. So 51 birds, you're going to have to, as silly as it sounds, provide justification. Uh, it bumps up to 100, then it drops down to 10 up until May 31st. So we can set the time period when this, when, you know, based off so, like based off what we're seeing out in the field and what other people are reporting. Um, so this isn't a tool to be used just so you don't have to type an explanation. Um, Cause I know, you know, chipping sparrow tends to get to be a monotonous one in the fall. Um, it's Cause now they're starting to linger into December and January. So maybe in the next year that filter might get bumped up to allow maybe one or two birds. So we can set the, the limit for that species as well. Not just the time. Um, we can also make a species rare as well, um, based off if it just isn't around anymore. So rough grouse, certainly it, that's already classified as rare in Westchester, but that would be one that, you know, they're just not here anymore. Um, or at least 
or maybe somewhere up in northern Westchester, but um, that bird's rare. Um, but then on the flip side, some birds like a short-eared owl that you would assume is, that's a rare bird for Westchester, um, or a long-eared owl, um, or solid owl. But you don't want to, there are other things you got to think about where if you put that as a rare bird and anyone that subscribes to the rare bird alerts is going to get that blast. And then the word's out on this bird and it's going to inevitably get mobbed by people. Um, that's just the sad truth these days. I mean, we all saw what happened at Croton Point this winter with all the red poles and the photographers. Um, so birds like that, we, keep, we tend to keep the filters at one. So it's not rare. Um, and therefore it doesn't get blown out to everybody subscribed to Westchester County uh, rare bird alert. So that kind of gives a add a layer of privacy to that species. Um, but some things we can avoid, like if you're a subscribed to Westchester needs alerts, right? Um, so it'll, sh it'll, whenever someone sees a species you haven't seen it, and that checklist is submitted, you'll get an email saying, you know, someone saw this bird, you don't have it on your list. It was here. Um, unfortunately, there's no workaround for the owls or any sensitive species like that. Um, the only unwritten workaround is if you delay your submitting your checklist for two weeks. Um, so on the 13th day, um, you submit your checklist and it will go completely under the radar. Um, unless it was rare or it was, you have to provide documentation, then Kyle and I or one of the other reviewers will see it. So, um, so that's the real, well, that's the only way to really hide um, sensitive species uh, right now. Um, otherwise, eBird doesn't really have a, um, a mechanism for that yet. Um, admittedly, some of these filters do have to get adjusted to reflect the times. Um, we all are aware of that. I've spoken to Rich extensively about it, but it's one of those things that's a massive undertaking because once you set a filter, you have to run the filter to filter out what like the new parameters, and then you have to go and review every single record for that species. So you can imagine something like chipping sparrow or even yellow warbler, um, if it, you increase the number. So you're gonna have to go through all of those records again. So it's, it's a time consuming process. Um, but I think once region nine split up into its um, own uh, counties, then we'll go one by one and uh, work the filters. I know John's already worked on Sullivan County. So I, that's one county that's going to be the first one done probably. All the other ones are probably going to take a long time. So we are going to need some help from all the boots on the ground people that have been out there for decades in these areas. So um, just something to keep on the radar. Zoom screen back here. Kyle, am I doing this or you? Yeah, you do this one, I'll do the next one. All right, so I know everyone's probably saying, well, you showed all the no dot, orange dot, red dot. What about the one that we all care about? Let's admit it. This is the only one that matters. So everyone sees this and they're like, yes. Like there is a sense of excitement when you get the R box on your checklist. Um, so this obviously means that this is a rare bird, um, whether it's a rare bird in general for the county, state, et cetera, or just rare for the time period. Again, like pine warbler in January. Um, so we like to joke around and say, whenever someone sees that R, that's exactly what they're thinking. And that's probably what they look like um, when they have to, you know, the thought is, oh, I'm gonna have to talk to these guys but that's not how it has to be either. Um, so Kyle. Yeah. So thanks for that, Sean. And um, so a lot, you know, obviously he brought up the rare birds and, you know, high counts, but a lot of times our job is really just looking at common mistakes. Um, so this is media error. Um, a lot of times when you go to add media on a checklist, you can put it in the wrong species by accident. So we'll email the observer and say, Hey, it looks like, you know, you put this in the wrong area. Um, sometimes fat finger is a big issue. So when you're putting a checklist in and you, you hit a species that you didn't mean to, um, I've done this in Duchess before. I've gotten called out very, very quickly by people that need, have needs alerts. 
Um, it happens, you know, don't be ashamed. We'll just send you an email and say, hey, fix that real quick, not a big deal. Um, another thing is hotspots. So for example, in Westchester, we see a lot of times people combine checklists between Croton train station and Croton point. Um, we can usually pick those out pretty quickly by seeing species like purple martin on a train station list or species like green wing teal and a nesting osprey on the Croton point list. Um, so we would email those observers, hey, you know, we'd appreciate it if you could just split off the species seen at the train station and on the Croton point. You know, this gives us a better database going forward. So follow up. So our favorite thing to do is approve a sighting. Our least favorite thing to do is unconfirm a sighting. So when you do see a rare bird, it pops up in our queue and we have the ability to email someone. So when our email goes out, there's a prefabricated email that's set up by eBird. Hey, dear username, there's a reason why your sighting was rare. You know, it's been seen this many times, et cetera. It gives the date and time of your checklist and some prefabricated additional text. A lot of times, Sean and I will remove some of that text and we'll put in some of our own commentary of why we're emailing you on the significance of the sighting. Um, and we use a lot of different references in our review. So for a sighting, we'll, we'll ask the reviewer for additional info. Did you hear it call? Um, did you see it? next to any other species to, see, to gauge size. We'll have a bunch of questions for the observer if they had any photos, things like that. And additionally, we also look at a lot of different publications. We talk to a lot of different people from the area on sightings to get their thoughts. Um, you know, I'm sitting here with the Birds of Dutchess County book. Um, Debbie had a good bird today in Dutchess County, so I looked up to see what the frequency of that, you know, bird being seen in Dutchess is. So we have a lot of different references um, just because Sean and I are the reviewers does not mean we are the best birders around. Um, we, are, we are good birders, decent birders. Um, we have a lot of useful people around us that we ask for help. Um, so that's kind of what we do when we review a sighting. Um, it's important here is bolded in red is when you receive an email from a reviewer, you have 14 days to respond. So a lot of times we'll send an email and we won't get a response. And 14 days later, that sighting goes unconfirmed automatically. Um, and it will get, the case will get opened up if we ever do get a response. Um, so it's just important to know that it is important to respond to the reviewers or your sighting may go unconfirmed. And the reason that never used to be, this is kind of a fairly new update. It was about a year old now. But uh, prior to that, you know, you would send out, you could fire out 30 emails in one evening and not get any responses back. And then those sightings are just sitting there in your review queue, just not going anywhere. And you don't want to just unconfirm them because, you know, they could be right, you know? Um, so eBird built this in there to alleviate that because their assumption is if you can't respond within 14 days about something, then you kind of don't care about the overall pic big picture and your sighting just gets unconfirmed. And I'm pretty sure to this day, we have not had anybody coming back to us saying, hey, like my sighting was unconfirmed, um, you know, and that was why. Um, so generally people are, people respond back to them. There's no rush once you respond back to us, you know, have some back and forth and we'll just go from there. So um, yeah, I think it's not really written anywhere on eBird's rep website. So I feel like that's important to highlight for everyone, um, the whole 14 day thing. All right, so some of the photos we have to look at. Um, if you can find a great horned owl in that picture, then uh, please let me know. Um, that long-billed dowager, that's actually my picture from uh, um, uh, Orange County over in Sitco Pond. I forget how many years ago, maybe like seven years ago. There was one reported there and I got this really crummy, heat shimmery picture. Um, and it's still sitting in the Orange County queue unconfirmed. Um, it is what it is, you know? So, and I don't know how that guy got in there, but um, yeah, you can imagine some of the types of photos that we have to look at and try to decipher for people. Cause we always, at the end of the day, wanna have, like we wanna um, confirm what people think they saw, especially if it's a blurry picture. Um, it's not like we were rooting against you. Um, we always try to make the ID on a picture. Um, sometimes we just can't. Um, 
And that's, that's just how it is, unfortunately. So we always do this, when we do this presentation, I get the easy part and I get to do the slide on when we accept the record, which is always nice. So as I discussed, you know, I have a lot of friends in this chat right now. And the hardest thing to do is, you know, review sightings and unconfirm my friend's sightings. So accepting a record is always my favorite route. Um, this is usually when there's, you know, a good amount of detail in the sighting and I feel confident that I can confirm it and put it into the eBirds database and, you know, that it'll be a good sighting. Um, and when we accept it, it becomes a public record. So eBird will use it in the public, you know, for any of its data significance, its trends of birds, publications. Um, when you search a species in the eBird, your sighting will also pop up. And obviously on like a rare sighting, it won't have unconfirmed next to your sighting on your checklist. So we have a lot of uh, records in our queue. When people submit historical things, um, they jump at the bottom. So our numbers continue to grow. Um, we try and be on top of it as quick as possible so that people don't think that we're waiting on theirs or treating them poorly. We always try to get to the most recent rare bird sightings as quick as possible. So Sean's going to tell you what happens. Yeah, this we... is always my favorite. No. <laughs> so when we don't accept your record, um, so in most cases, um, this does not mean that we, as in Kyle and I, don't believe you. Um, so basically, that just means that the documentation is not enough to suffice going into the public database. That's all. It's not personal. Um, this is just for strictly database integrity. Um, we're not out here to tell you that you are wrong. Um, that's not why I signed up for it because I hate when people tell me I'm wrong. And I think we could all agree that we hate when people do that to us. Um, so, um, kind of, that's why I started this whole thing with the eBirds mission statement, um, just to kind of bring it all together here. Um, and, you know, just like a, a hint, like a tip rather, um, you know, when you're out in the field, you know, and you see something and, you, and it kind of just a bootio flies through the trees and you can't get a good look at it, or there's that gull way out on the Hudson River, um, it can't quite nail the ID on. I mean, let's not, I said, don't make it weird, but let's, let's be realistic. Um, let's kind of just simplify it to a species if you really can. Cause then um, if you're, it's one thing if you're trying to call, let me, I don't know, um, think of something here, like a, a booty of flying through the trees and it's uh you know, it's a red tail, but you try to make it a Swainson's hawk, for example. And this is within region nine, obviously. Um, you're going to need a lot more proof than just field notes, basically. Um, so why stretch it? Why go down? We're going to get into like the rarity rabbit hole. Why go down that path? Um, kind of just, you, you kind of have to just, as with life, just kind of punt it and forget about it. Just move on. Um, I know like if you're, I feel like if you're signed up for this chat, you're all in and you love the hobby, you're out all the time. And there's not gonna be any shortage of birds that you miss, I, like you, you can't get the ID on in the field. It's always gonna happen. And you just kind of have to learn to live with it kind of thing. I mean, there are many times where I put um, bird species sometimes, um, you know, gull species, um, turn species, stuff like that, it's just, comes with the territory and even if you put that general species that's still useful information for eBird. Um, so we just kind of wanted to convey that thought to everyone um, and then kind of like this new catchphrase that we've been speaking to a lot of other reviewers um, especially Andy Guthrie and Doug Gotchfeld down in uh, the city and they I mean they review I think records for the whole country or at least Doug might do it for the whole world I think. Um, and their phrase right now is extraordinary sightings require extraordinary proof. Um, and that's kind of where we're, that's kind of the direction we're going uh, with right now. So how strict are we? I mean, everyone knows we're very lenient, I feel. Um, and we know what helps is we know a lot of people. 
So we kind of can just, all right, yeah, either one of us were there or so, like were there were multiple people there or we're friends with you or we know you're a great birder and we can just approve the sighting. Um, and I'll, I'll go to the approved screen in a little while to show you what that looks like. Um, other reviewers, you know, I was talking to Doug um, down at that, uh, the Martin that was in Prospect Park. And he was saying when he found the Mugull down there, he was writing down every single person's name that was there. Um, so when they submitted their eBird list, he can approve it. Otherwise you might have people down there misidentifying immature ring-billed gulls uh, for this bird. Um, so just to give you a sense of what other reviewers do, um, I mean, we're not there as far as that goes, um, but it's uh, extraordinary signings require extraordinary proof. That's kind of, like, that's, that's our mantra right now. And uh, we just, you know, want to let everybody know that. Um, so a little funny story. Uh, there, last spring, there was an early gray crested flycatcher sighting up in Ulster County. And I approved the sighting because it was a picture of a gray crested flycatcher. I approved it. It was end of April. All right, you know, we've had some early migrants here and there. It happens. I approve it. And then Rich Guthrie looks at the photo again and flags it. And he calls me and he's like, hey, I don't know if you noticed this, but that dragonfly in the flycatcher's mouth is not that that insect either isn't native to New York or shouldn't be up here yet. So he even like, and he emailed that person and he emailed eBird. I don't know what the result and result was, but that, that was not a, that was, I don't want to say it's false, but that wasn't a true sighting of that species up in Ulster County. Um, so even the little things that people, like if they're trying to sneak something by, like a lot of people look at these, records. Um, not just, as we said, us. Um, Tony LeCoring, he's a, he wrote the book on Raptor ID, one of the many books on Raptor ID, and he frequently flags down pictures of raptors, mainly Sharpies and Coopers, um, always is flagging them down. And I go into the review queue and there's a sharp shin hawk that Tony LeCoring flagged and it says Cooper's hawk. Um, so just another um, little fun story I thought I'd tell you guys. Um, and then something that I think comes with time and experience, but it's worth talking about is should it, the question of, should I provide proof of a bird that's not rare, but in an odd place? Um, so I'm going to go to this checklist from Croton Point, Croton train station last spring when I went down to go see the semi-palmated plovers and I'm scanning the shoreline and there is a black billed cuckoo just hanging out in the reeds. And I did one of these double takes with my scope and I was like, whoa, hello. And I'm like, in my back of my head, I'm like, nobody's gonna believe this. Let me just get a photo. And th again, this comes in time. Um, you're not gonna be, some people might not be able to realize that right off the bat. But just one of those things, if you feel in the back of your mind that you need to get some proof one way or another, Take a picture, get a recording, do something. Um, so I just found that kind of relatable. Um, get back to the presentation. And just, this is kind of the third rail that I'm gonna gingerly step on. Um, the top tens we found have a strong influence on bird ID. I'm, you know, without getting way into it, but if you're one of the, if you participate in or have fun doing it, um, I think this is just a, like a PSA to just, you know, be honest a little bit. If there's something that you're deep down, if you look at your list and you're like, ah, that's really, I didn't get a good look at that bird. Or like your photo is just terrible. You don't know what the bird was. Like the, everything was just very convoluted. Maybe take it off and just let it go. Um, again, just, I'm, you know, I'm just going to go to the next slide. I'm not going to like really get into it. But uh, you kind of hopefully pick up what I'm putting down there. Thanks, Sean. And, and I'll just add a couple of things on that so that it doesn't make you look like the only bad guy. Um, sightings get unconfirmed sometimes. It happens to all of us. Um, I've had many sightings unconfirmed. I've heard sightings of, you know, David Sibley making mistakes on seeing birds. I've heard of a story of the New Jersey 
bird committee shutting down a Kevin Carlson sighting in New Jersey. All the, a lot of the best birders, you know, have sightings that are unconfirmed. Um, and the best way to have confirmed sightings is strengthen your eBird list. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you could really boost your eBird list to help, you know, sightings get confirmed. So when you're observing a bird, really pay attention to it. You know, anything from color, size, comparing it to other species, wing length, bill size, you know, whatever you can make out on the bird that pops out, you can include in your eBird list and it'll help greatly when we review it. Things like behavior, uh, wagging a tail like a palm warbler is huge. Um, then it goes to the next level. Things like photos or recordings are huge. Um, they don't even have to be great photos. Like Sean showed before, sometimes we're able to make IDs on really poor photos. So you want me to go to the checklist? Yeah, you want to click on that one? Yeah. We're going to exit again. Uh-oh. Oh, go back. Ah. Get out of here. Um, so here is an example of a list oh, right. from uh, myself, Steve, Rappaport, and Kyle. Uh, we went down to Point Lookout this past January. Um, lots of crazy stuff down there. Um, there's a windy day, lots of shorebirds blown onto the parking lot. Um, and all of these shorebirds gave us the excla exclamation point. So we had to provide some sort of proof and um, some numbering here. Um, but the picture that we're kind of referring to is this common muir that Kyle picked out flying through the inlet and uh, Steve managed to get a picture of it and it was just good enough. You can see the pointy bill. Unfortunately, you can't zoom in on this um, do right now, but if you zoomed in on the picture, you can see where the black is kind of dripping into the white cheek. Um, and th so that picture plus the description, the sighting was confirmed. Cause it was funny, there was two people out on the Jones Beach side and they had a thick build in New York. So it was kind of one of those like, uh-oh, someone's wrong here. Or we're both right. And it turns out, I think both parties were right. So there are two separate species of muir in that area. So um, the picture doesn't have to be perfect. Sometimes it could just enough to get you there, plus a written description. So. Yeah, so, you know, Sean's saying, you know, whatever you can put in your list to help us review is the best. Um, there was one occasion where we had a photo from Putnam. It was a really poor photo of a flycatcher that the user put down as an olive side flycatcher. And we really couldn't tell from the photos exactly, you know, if it was an olive side or not. But the user wrote down that it was wagging its tail constantly as it was perched, which led us to believe that it had to be a Phoebe. Um, so things like that really help us with the review. Um, photos are great. Sean doesn't have a camera, but for some reason you saw his black bill cuckoo shot. He's able to get some awesome digiscope shots. Um, give it a try in your backyard, even on, you know, common species, so that when you're out in the field, you know, it could really help. Um, recordings. I try when I have a finch flyover or a good bird calling, I just use the voice memo app on my phone. Um, simple. I just press record and put that on my checklist just to help, you know, validate what I heard so people can, you know, hear what I'm listening to, et cetera. Um, things like rails, um, this is huge for, and, you know, I want to harp on the fact that May's coming up and we're going to be getting some fly catchers moving through. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these fly catchers cannot be identified by sight and really require more than just sight. So, we're going to be strict on some of the fly catchers that come through in May, specifically things like Acadian fly catcher, um, willow fly catcher, leaf fly catcher. And we're going to ask for things like recordings on these species just to confirm that these are the species. And we won't confirm photos, you know, without additional data, just so that we don't put a photo of a leased fly catcher into the eBirds database that's actually a willow. And we just couldn't, you know, tell based on the site. Uh, so there's some species that we really need recordings or photos of um, to confirm it. An example would be someone reported a king rail in the area. It would be really hard to confirm a sighting like that without substantial, you know, with a recording of its call, you know, et cetera. So. Or that Kentucky warbler that's deep in the understory that's not going to come out 
you're going to need that microphone to get a recording of it. So I personally use, I have an, I work off an Android. So I have a, I use RecForge 2 as the app. I have the symbol there. So that's what it looks like in the app store. Um, you can edit your audio, crop it, do all that stuff. And it's Eber compatible. So you can upload it right to your checklist. And up to this point, it's worked really well, um, except for the ads, but I'm not paying for it either. So, um, and one thing we want to highlight, um, kind of when you're seeing, we have this little funny meme here um, with, I feel like the dilemma that most of us encounter more often than not sometimes, um, when you see a bird, whether it's at a distance or it's kind of hidden amongst the brush, um, what is, like, is it a rarity? Um, and so it's kind of easier to think from, all right, what is the most likely possibility? And then kind of start making your progression that way, as opposed from starting at, this is a, I don't know, let's pick something of, Connecticut warbler, maybe. Um, and then maybe it, it turns out to be a Nashville um, at the end, especially, you know, in the fall, obviously, um, or even a common yellow throat. Um, so kind of start from what the logical choice is and work your way up to the rarity. Because it's a funny little psychological thing. Like we all want to see the rare bird. We all want to make that bird rare. Um, and so our brain kind of does play tricks on us. Um, remember last year, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole for like a week. It was bad. Um, I took this god awful picture of was was probably a, an immature red throated loon way out in Edith Reed. And for the life of me, I tried making this thing a Pacific loon, and you know what? It just wasn't happening. That that bottom line. And so I just forgot about it. I deleted I think all the pictures. I just, erase it from my memory obviously i still haven't forgotten about it but um yeah so and like what kyle said with all those empids like those alder fly catchers like you know phoebe could sound like that you know if you can't see the bird um obviously there's some areas where we're just gonna approve them you know areas in fawn stock or acadians we're thick with them up here um so that's a that you know that that's something simple willow fly catchers at edith reed and chrome point and um you know Yellow bellies, that's an easy one, all sided, same. Um, so yeah. Um, all right, so before you submit your list, um, I found this to be a very useful little slide I made last minute. So before you hit submit, you know, just go over a few things. Do you have the correct location? Um, the correct hotspot, this does not apply to the Atlas. Um, uh, right now, all Atlas questions go to Anne. They, we are not answering any Atlas questions. Um, so are you using your, the personal hot, the designated hotspot for your list? Do you have all your species recorded on there? Do you have proper documentation? Any additional field notes? Some people like to put the weather, the tide cycle. I know for me, for like birds like American Woodcock and Whippoorwill, I will put the time when I first heard it. So then I don't, I know, so I can kind of sleep in as up to the, like the minute when I, so I'm not getting up any earlier than I need to. Um, so I will put little metadata notes in the, for stuff like that. Um, and then are your photos and audio under the correct species? This is obviously after your list has been submitted. I'm gonna go to uh, another list here from local birder, uh, Kevin McGrath, who, after a couple of days hiatus, this boat tail grackle showed up at Edith um, at Marshlands Conservancy, and he just nailed it with all the documentation. He has the audio, he has the photos, he has the written documentation. So this is pretty much not you're not going to always get all of this. We understand that, but I mean this is like textbook perfect documentation, um, if you ask me. So, you know, I want to, you know, every now and then we will email people and just say thank you for the documentation because it does make our lives easier. Um, and that's another reason why we're doing this. Like this makes our lives easier and it makes everyone else's lives easier. So we don't have to have a back and forth with um, some of these things. So the more information you provide, the easier it is on our end. You might not even hear from us. We might just improve it sort of thing. Um, so I think I hit all of those. All right, let me just get out of all of these. And 
Let's get back into our PowerPoint and here you go, Kyle. Sure. So when we do, uh, when we review a sighting, we have a lot of different resources at our fingertips to use. Um, depending on the level of rarity, we'll configure with different people. There's a lot of people in this chat right now that we talk to about sightings. Um, we have a very close knit birding community these days. Um, so even with the Sama River, you know, Tuesday talks, we all get together and we kind of talk about what's going on. Um, I subscribe to eBirds Need Alerts, which I recommend for anyone that's interested in birding in their local counties. What happens is if you don't have, you could subscribe for all time needs alerts or yearly needs alerts. If you're interested in, you know, doing a, a count, you know, a, a number for each year. So a lot of times, for example, in Dutchess County, I'm subscribed. And anytime someone reported redhead woodpecker this year, which I have not seen in Dutchess County, I will get an alert. Um, this helps me review greatly as a lot of times for the great backyard bird count, um, there will be novice birders who put down red-bellied woodpeckers as redheaded. So that helps me, you know, find those sightings and I could review those. We also look at things like eBird species maps. So for example, we've had a lot of early arrival sightings in Ulster County of early warblers, flycatchers, et cetera. And so what I'll do is I'll explore species for the current year to see how far these migrants have actually made it up on the Northeast. For example, someone reported a yellow warbler recently in Ulster County, you know, but looking on the hotspot map or species map for this year, there's been only a few reports north of Maryland, basically. So that I use that to see, you know, where the species migration is there a lot of the early yellow warbler showing up that'll help me in my review to see if it's a possible sighting. Um, for example, on the seventh, I believe it was, there was a big push of Bonaparte skulls through the area. Um, they were soon, they were seen on a lot of water bodies, reservoirs, lakes, the river, the sound. Um, so if a report on the seventh came through, I would look at that and be like, you know, it makes sense. You know, a lot of other people are seeing that bird today. It makes sense that they're in the area. Sean and I are in a reviewer group chat where we, you know, if we get a rare bird or in, in pictures, we can talk about it in the group chat. Um, things like immature goals. Um, we're not super, super, super experienced in immature goals. And we have a lot of references like Tom and Gail on the chat here and Shoei down in Long Island um, to help us review those. Um, this winter has been big for finches, big finch flight. And hoary red pole, hoary fever was hot this February and January. Um, and there's a lot of experts in their field and they have a Facebook group called uh, Finches Eruptions and Mass Crops where a lot of people were posting photos and experts like Matt Young would uh, chime in on their, you know, their idea of the bird or the photos, et cetera. So we have a lot of different tools that we use to make a review. So it's not just me and Sean shooting out of left field. You know, we use books, we talk with people, et cetera. So those are all different types of things. Um, the WhatsApp groups for, for low HUD, including Ulster. Um, we have the Duchess Peeps, which is like a text message rare bird alert. So we use all these different things to see what's going on and, and make our judgment calls. And what's cool about the, uh, the eBird reviewer group chat is the reviewers, that it's every reviewer in the world. So like um, someone had a probable snow goose uh, Ross's goose hybrid up here in Lake Car uh, by Lake Carmel, and you know that's a tough one. To with the pictures were good, they're good, but not like you know perfect to nail it for Ross's goose. So you know I sent it out to basically the whole world. Um, only one person got back to me, but um, just so you guys know, we can send it out to literally pretty much anyone who's looking at this stuff, including eBird Central, so Marshall, um, Chris, Ian, Jenna, etc. So. Kyle. So Sean got me into reviewing a couple years back and it's really helped out my birding a lot. Um, from basic birds, I mean, you know, when we, when you use eBird, you're putting everything out there for people to see. And, you know, we're doing a scientific data here and everything's important. Um, so when people think, oh, you guys are reviewers, you're just going to approve your own sightings. I mean, the truth is more now than ever, I feel like, you know, we have a, you know, 
an eyeglass on us and people are watching, you know, our checklist to make sure that we're also following the rules. So I try as much as I can to get photos and recordings and, and justify all the sightings that we have. Um, we also make, make mistakes and, you know, there's a presumption that we're flawless and that we're perfect. Um, but the truth is every birder makes mistakes from time to time. Um, and it's really just Sean and I job to go through this data and be a face to face person and connect. Um, I've made my mistakes publicly. Um, for one example would be last May on, it was May 1st, it was the day after there was a kind of a weird storm and there were some turns on the Hudson and I picked up, I picked up a flock of turns going south past Bennings Point and I quickly peeped them on as foresters turns. And the truth was I, you know, I, I really should have made a smarter call when I put that out. The truth was I had no right to to speciate those down to foresters based on my view. You know, I, I wanted to get the peep out quickly. Um, so things like that, you know, going forward, I, I pay a lot more attention and, and make sure I'm spot on before I'll put something in a rare bird chat. Um, and it really makes me look at my sightings more closely, even on, you know, things like purple finch, et cetera. Um, it makes us a lot bigger, better birders. You know, we look at things in much finer detail and we try very hard not to make mistakes. Um, and we look back at, you know, some of our checklists from when we were kids and, uh, you know, we apologize to everyone in the community of anything <laughs> annoying that we did when we were younger. Um, so it's a learning process for us all. And, you know, we're going to work with you guys to, to move it forward. Um, John, what, what things have you, uh, learned? <laughs> um, so these are just two of probably the many things that I, that I know about. Um, so this past year, I thought I had a what I wanted to be like a Nelson's gull over at the Beacon train station this year. Um, very funky looking immature herring gull. The base of the bill, it was pretty much pink all the way down with a little black tip and a bright pink too. And it was very light. Even Kyle saw it when he got there. He's like, wow, that's a weird one. Um, but after you know, sending her out to Andy, Showy, um, and I sent up to Willie Deanna all the way upstate. And he came back to me saying very funky herring gull that he would probably give a second look, but then keep scanning sort of thing um so hybrids uh, after this year before red pole cackling geese it's like i'm kind of over them at this point um i'm i can't wait for the warblers to show up uh, you know aside from the brewsters and lawrence's uh, even though those are fairly easy um so probably my biggest one i'm just happy like technology wasn't where it's at now when i did it but when that elegant elegant turn made a one or two day well it was, i think it was one day uh, appearance out at Cubsog uh, Town Park out on, in Suffolk County. And uh, I, I was excited the next morning. I left my house at you know, 3 a.m. I drove down there, walked out in low tide. So, uh, well, the tide was coming in. I'm seeing all these turns out there and I'm like, that's it. I got it. So I go on the New York State listserv. Not even a, there was no WhatsApp back then. It was just New York State listserv. Elegant turn there. I remember I waited and then I took some pictures and I waited until that tide cycle changed. And, you know, I forgot who came out there. I think like Showy was out there, Shane Blodgett, um, Mike Shanley, maybe Sean Syme also. I mean, a ton of people came out there and then I showed some of my pictures like that's a royal turn. And it was just like, a, ugh, all these people came out to look at this bird because I said I saw it, but it wasn't there. Um, Neil said it probably would have went out anyway, but um, yeah, just one of those, I feel like I wasn't as embarrassed back then as I am now talking about it. Um, but it's just one of those like, you know, face plant kinds of moments. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, that's, that's all we have. Um, we're going to exit this and we'll show you what the reviewer screen looks like real quick. And um, we'll show you how we um, accept or, well, we're not going to unconfirm anything here for um, this purpose, but I, how we accept records. So this is what our reviewer screen looks like. Right now we have 340 sightings in there and our, we don't even have the sightings for the rest of region nine loaded into our database yet. So that's probably gonna double if not triple um, soon. So that's why what Kyle is getting at saying, you know, we have a lot of stuff to go through and we try to get it done as quick as possible just in case someone missed the bird you know, we can tell them, hey, you got the picture of the wrong bird and they can still go back. Um, so I'll show you how we go about reviewing something. 
Um, all right, let's go to Kyle's Blue Gross Speak at Debbie's house. Say this is like the perfect timing for this too. So there we have it. We open it up. Um, we can see when the checklist was created, when it was last edited, all the metadata, location, what he was doing, the protocol stationary, how long he was there, um, and all the birds that he saw, they're already accepted because they're all common birds. Blue Gross Speak requires documentation. So Kyle took these great photos. There it is. And we simply click the box. And if we were to, let's say we were to unconfirm this. Let me just uncheck that. So if we were to unconfirm it, just some nomenclature that, you know, that's in here. The BRC, that's a bird record committee. So if um, NYSARC rejected that sighting, then we would reject it as well. So this is like a new thing going on this year where um, eBird reviewers are kind of working um, with the NYSARC reviewers when it comes to NYSARC reviewable species. Um, and vice versa goes on when there's something that they accept. There's a BRC accepted. Um, documentation, it's an inadequate count. Oh, doc documentation inadequate for the count, meaning you had 12,000, I don't know, um, no geese, and you have, you just said they were there or I don't know, just gave us some really poor answer. Um, that's it, documentation inadequate, um, count. And then documentation inadequate for the species, that means you just couldn't provide enough documentation to accept that species into the database. So if Kyle had no pictures and just said blue bird, or something like that, and I emailed him and he got back to me adding nothing to the table, um, then that's what that would be. Um, Media ID question. This is something if we see a picture like in the wrong slot, you know, we'll media ID question. And then it actually doesn't get unconfirmed. It just kind of stays there. And as a reminder for us to send out that uh, email. Observer error. That kind of means that this is kind of a fail safe for everything. That the observer is just wrong. Um, that's that's kind of what that's there for. Um, the introduced exotic uh, category. That's gonna, I'm waiting for them to roll out the update for this. Um, so any ringneck pheasants, um, let's see, Bob White, given the, uh, Bob White I think falls in that category. Uh, helmeted guinea fowl, stuff like that, peacocks, you know, they'll get unconfirmed that it goes into introduced exotic and eBird's gonna eventually have its own exotic um, introduced species thing. I don't know, they haven't really gone into detail about it. Um, species misidentified, if it's just, again, flat out wrong. There are some redundancies as you're probably seeing here. Um, review requested, that means um, if we're looking through a checklist and someone has a species that is either under the wrong picture or it's just a, a weird sighting to have at that time of the year or that location, then this is just to, this bumps it into the review queue. So we know to like maybe circle back to that person about it. Um, sensitive species, um, eBird has a whole list of what they deem as sensitive. Black rail, northern goshawk for, for New York purposes, uh, spruce grouse also. Um, so if any of those birds showed up, you know, that's the one thing that we can see that the public can't is if something like that was in our territory. Um, we would see those sightings. Um, and then taxonomic issue, that's rarely used. That's if someone refers to, I think there's still some old tax, taxonomic names in the eBird uh, bird list. So if someone uses like an old name, then you can um, just flag that down, have them change it. Um, easier when we accept things, put the file box again. So rare bird committee accepted. If Field notes, this is one of those things where other people, the bird was there all day. Um, a lot of people saw it, photographed it. It's a blue gross beak. Um, and Kyle just provided field notes. That's fine. I was talking to Barbara Michelin today and she's like, so what am I gonna do about this? I'm like, just type in what you saw, it's fine. I'm here, the bird's here. Every, Debbie's looking out her window. Like, don't worry about it. Um, documentation, photo, video. So that's where this would fall under. Boom, photos, done. Observer experience. Um, we don't use this for everybody. There are some people where we can just fast track it. Oh, like this person saw this here. Maybe they don't. This sighting. <laughs> um, just observer experience done. 
because um, that's someone that has a proven track record over many decades of birding that we just don't have to worry about it. Um, we trust them. And record not exceptional. Hmm. I have to look back at that one. Um, actually, I don't. I've never used that one. Um, and then species known to be at location. So when if Debbie still has this bird in two more days, um, and people start reporting it, then that's just an easy reason known to be at location. It's there. It's there. It's there. It's there. That's kind of how it works. That's how it works. So here we go. Accept documentation, photo, audio, change, and it's there. So how we do that, um, you could also, so here's my checklist from Debbie's house today. You could also mark a checklist, not public. Um, if the distance is too long, this kind of applies to maybe the cat skills or uh, the Adirondacks where you're hiking very long distances and you traverse many different habitats, but you can't have a list for Slide Mountain that has birds that were along the river. So like you could have like a migrating solitary sandpaper, then big nail thrush. Like you can't, it, those need to be separated. Um, duplicate checklist if it's like a party. Um, checklist if there's just, this is another blanket one, just an error. Um, list building, that's if someone just dumps their entire life list uh, to the eBird platform, or if it's just one sighting that, that's historic that they don't have a day for. Like I have a King Eider sighting from Rhode Island that I don't remember. So I just put 1-1-1900 and it gets automatically flagged as list building. Multi-party, that's for Christmas bird counts and such, um, where the vast differences of uh, distances and uh, habitats covered. Multi-party and it just goes not public. Protocol error, another catch-all for all this. Location issue, if you're not using the correct hotspot, like your Crone Point Park, and you're um, you're at the Crone train station and you're putting in, uh, let's uh, grasshopper sparrow. You know, um, obviously that bird is not at the train station. So that would, you know, we would talk to you about this first to have you change it, obviously. But if you don't get back to us, so if you're really adamant that there's a grasshopper sparrow there, but can't provide proof, then you're probably going to get this. So I hope I didn't breeze through that, but um, again, the secrets here. Um, we can search, I mentioned, for any kind of observation in any of the territories that we cover. So um, let's just, bird of the day, let's just, we'll go to, we'll use Duchess as the assignment. We'll go to the United States, New York, and we'll type in blue rosebeak and let it think for a second and boom, it gives every blue grosbeak sighting from Dutchess County since 1991. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of a, a quick way for us to just pull stuff up and look it over. Um, so that's one kind of really cool thing that we can do that I really do like. So I guess it's questions time. <laughs>